we'll go, we'll go ahead and get started this evening. Um, tonight, this breakout session is on how are we going to engage the church in doing work internationally. And so my name is Jody Peterson. I oversee our, we call it the Serve Department at Cornerstone, which is a church just here a couple miles down the road. Um, I'm also a part of a uh, group of missions pastors and leaders called Arizona Global Leader Gathering. We, we gather a couple times a year just to share ideas and learn from one another because we truly believe that it's through conversations and networking that we become better together. And so it's just been an honor to be in the valley and be a part of what God is doing through the local churches, of being a part of this, a church that is involved in sending, but also engaging people. And so I'm going to spend some time sharing some ideas of what Cornerstone has been doing to engage um, people internationally. And then I would love just to hear some ideas because I think I'm like, there's some areas I'm like, we need to continue to go and get ideas from one another. So we'll provide some space for that at the end. All right. So tonight we're going to cover three different topics. We're going to talk about um, international trips. How do we build awareness for our partners right here at our own local churches for what God's doing internationally? And then how can we support global workers, also known as missionaries? So international trips, um, I think this is probably one of the most common ways that churches are involved in working internationally, is to be able to find an organization or a church internationally to be able to partner with and send people back and forth. And so uh, at Cornerstone, our goal is how do we, well, the reason why we have a serve team is how do we meet needs, know people, and share Jesus. And when we talk about meeting needs, it's not just meeting physical needs, it's also the spiritual, the relational, more that holistic approach. Because when we think about people living um, in poverty or third world countries, we often think of materialistic poverty. However, when research has been done and they've surveyed people living in materialistic poverty, what is poverty? Well, they mention materialistic things. They often reference the social um, stigmas that go along with it and how they feel like they have a sense of, of voicelessness, no power. And so we kind of redid our missions program a couple years ago and just looked at it and said, man, how has the Western church church been a part of taking away the voice of people and it's totally we have this conversation with our teams before we ever go and just start asking like how has the western church done that and how can we be really intentional about empowering people how do we encourage and not answer for others what they can answer for themselves i recently heard um, someone share do you truly believe that um, the people living in poverty are their an own answer to poverty. And when we thought about that, like sometimes we, as a Western world, we feel like we have a better education, um, some of the experiences, and we have to set that mindset behind and really work to listen and engage because people living in their own culture know best, and they've got to be the ones that pull them out. And so we've really been intentional about how do we come alongside and give people, people a voice. So that's um, meeting needs. We will, on our international trips, we look at, there's two, tip, two types we send. We send people who are specialized. So maybe that's a medical team. Maybe that's a team of teachers going in to do education. A variety of teams like that. Uh, we have a team that's going to do a men's conference because that's what our partner has asked for. However, when we do those specialized, we say our goal is to build relationships. We want to get to know one another. And if we're going to do a work project type trip, we're only going to do it if you guys also have people involved in it. So, for example, uh, we partner with a church in Zambia. And I said, okay, here's the deal. Like Our men are going to come in, and they're going to want to get the project done. But you've got to really encourage the relationship side of it. And together, as they were building relationships through the work project, it was absolutely incredible, just the life change that happened as our team came back and they shared that with their families. And so when we do work projects, we really intentionally want to do it together and leverage that for an opportunity to build relationships. Um, 
We also do trips that are just open. We know that when we take people outside of their comfort zones here and put them in a, in a context that's so different from what they're used to, they experience Jesus in a whole new way. And that's where that whole discipleship part comes in and a faith-building um, encounter that happens. And so we just say, as we go, we how do we prepare through devotionals, spending time together just to spend time in God's word, to be able to pray and, and just seek that wisdom as we're, we're serving internationally. Uh, so we do those trips and we do what we call like encounter trips. So just where we just take a variety of different people over to for us to be able to learn from local people and then from them to be able to learn from us that back and forth side of it. And our goal is to have just a couple partnerships. So we, ha- we partner with five different organizations and uh, we want to build more long-term relationships and keep sending people back so that they know there's a church on the other side of the world that sees them, that cares for them, and that knows them. And, and our part of our plan is also we want to partner with local churches. While they may be a part of an organization, how do we work with the local pastor? Because those churches are the hope of the world where sometimes organizations come and go, but the church the church remains. And so um, we have trips that are short, kind of like that entry level. So being here in Arizona, it makes it great that you can just hop in a vehicle and drive three and a half hours and be in Mexico. And that, uh, we just took a group of, I think it was like 24 people down and about half of them had never been out of the country before. And it took a lot of courage to get in that vehicle the first time. They said, there's a number of them said, there are sleepless nights as we anticipated what this trip would encounter. Um, but as we debriefed the conversation at the end, a number of them said, man, we learned what it was like to pray for one another. And I'm excited to bring that home and learn how I can pray for my neighbors as I don't even know them. So that's the life transformation that ha- can happen through or even weekend trips. Then we have some week trips to Mexico a little further down where we'll fly into, and then some that are 10 to 2 weeks, to be uh, 10 days to 2 weeks that they can um, experience God in a different way. And some of those are in Africa. We also have a partner that we have worked with in India. So, so we try to get a variety of what the time commitment, the amount of fundraising that's involved, and just the experience so that it would be all, all a little bit different. All right, I also want to share, in the midst of the pandemic, we took over 50 people on virtual trips. So we said, we're not, like, God's still working all around the world, and while we may be in quarantine, how can we do something different? So uh, we started brainstorming, and then one of our partners developed virtual trips. So I just want to share a little bit about this, because I think there are pieces you may be able to apply um, in your own context, whether you're still going on in-person trips, but we found that there are some people that are never going to be able to go internationally, but they want to have an, in, uh, an experience. And so we, we said, okay, let's do this. And so it, I was like, will people really be able to walk away with an experience like a mission trip when you actually fly and you're out of the country? And we saw, we found that people acknowledge it. Like this is my first mission trip that I get to be on. It was low. Uh, it didn't have a large cost. That little bit of cost helped provide for the organization. It provided you were able to do it from the comfort of your home. And while there were some live Zoom calls, there was also flexibility to be able to do it uh, on your time schedule. So I'm just going to kind of walk through what a virtual trip looks like for some people. This is a very new concept. Uh, it is a shared experience about a place or a ministry from the comfort of your home and then you learn information and experiences through technology and on these trips what we found that was super important why we did them is we were able to share an experience together just like when you go physically on a trip we met on zoom calls and we had done activities together that we could connect we were all connected on a whatsapp group and that provided some community as we did it as well it provided information we felt like now we have people that are better informed about what God is doing around the world and with that country and that partner so if they were ever to go in person they're now more educated when they go and experience it. We also had people who had actually been um, on a trip to South Africa go on it, and they said, we learned new pieces that we didn't know when we were on the ground. So that was just a really unique experience. And then there was a lot of flexibility. And so some of the groups that we took on it, uh, we took small groups through it, we took individuals, but then we said, man, what would it look like if we gathered our global workers who are working internationally and some of our partners 
as far as like organizations, and we got on a call together. And I think at one point we had like four or five different countries all on the call going through a shared experience together. Um, and so it was just really cool. We had one of our global workers um, in India, and she made one of the meals, because one of the activities was to make a, a dish there. And so she made it, and then she brought it to the group of uh, friends that she had in India. And they said this, even Malva pudding was even a big hit in, in India. And so you can see this as people were, as we gathered on the team, we first introduced ourselves on WhatsApp. And so everyone said what would be their, their packing, their favorite like snack that they would bring on that trip. So you got to learn a little bit about, about people and what they would appreciate. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see what, what are their favorite, favorite traveling tips. So we talked about the different groups that we had going at small groups, and you can see all ages. We had um, one of our small churches that uh, we do like a, they're kind of like a Sunday school group of young professionals, and they all went together on a virtual trip. We had a small group that had people who were in their 30s to people in their 70s go on a trip together. So different different groups that were bonding. What can you experience? So we, through this experience, what, how it's set up is that you have like an hour of uh, something that you, like a devotional book that you would go through and a web page that would guide you through the experience. So there was some sort of hands-on activity. There were a couple experiential videos. So we got to meet the pastors, maybe an aspect of that ministry. And... Um, and through that, we got so we learned about the ministry. We learned about the culture. So one of the days, we learned about some recipes. Another day, we actually got to experience some of the, the nature. So here's a live webcam experience from a safari park that we got to be a part of. Um, like I said, we made mobile pudding one time. We learned we went with a partner in Mexico, and they taught us how to make tortillas. Mine turned out not soft at all. It was more like a chip. But we were laughing about, like, we were, so it was a shared experience. And one of the gals on our team is like, I can't cook at all. I'll light my kitchen on fire. Where can I order this meal locally and have it delivered to my house? So again, you've got to share these experiences. Uh, we had one small group that actually got together, and they cooked the meal together. Instead of doing it at home on their own, they, they did that. How this virtual trip was delivered, it was through emails, it was through WhatsApp. Like I said, there was a website, a portal that we got on each day that gave us information. And then every day, four out of the five days, we did live Zoom calls. Um, and so that gave us the opportunity to interact face to face. And I would say this is what makes an experience. Because while you can watch videos on your own time, to be actually live, that's where it became the personal connection. So it was connection with our team members, but it was also connections with the partners. We got a FaceTime with the pastors in Mexico or the pastors um, in South Africa and asked them questions about their childhood and about what day-to-day -day looks like. What does COVID and the pandemic, how is it impacting their lives? Um, and that was impactful. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So the trip was not just like one hour Zoom call. It was like daily for several days. Sorry. Yeah, so we did a five-day trip. Most of them were five-day trips. Um, and every day we set, set aside about two hours. Okay. One hour would be something that you would do on your own. You'd get on the, the portal that day, work through the videos, learn a little bit of like some of the cultural experiences, whether you're making a meal or you were... Um, we actually built some, you can see here, this is what a daughter, uh, their family put together, um, these flower flowers out of recycled items, so they gave directions on how to do that. One day we wrote cards to caregivers, and so um, those are some of the hands-on experiences you did. So, and then one hour in the evenings, typically we would do a Zoom call. Yeah. And we even said, even before a team goes on a trip with some of our partners, this is super helpful because it helps you understand a little bit of what to expect when you go in country. So here are some of the results, and I think this is just pretty amazing. Just I'll, I'll share some of them. Uh, Josh said, my girls watched the safari video on loop as we enjoyed our African feast. So their whole family got to experience this trip. Malva pudding, oh my goodness, is that good. We also love the stamp and beans. We added curry, which was a nice touch. 
um, such a fun and delicious night picks to come. And so it's just neat for a family to be able to experience some of the culture together. Angie said, thank you for the encouragement and inspiring trip. As Michelle said, just keep one step of obedience at a time. And I love what Leslie said. I have loved culture, the culture day. Hearing from Mama Dorothy made me realize how important it is to care and love these people, serving as Jesus' feet, showing them how much they are cared and loved. And seeing the animals was way cool. What a beautiful country. We even had someone on our trip say, like, on WhatsApp, everyone get on the live webcam right now. There's an elephant at the watering well. Uh, so there were some moments where you, we had some of that, some fun pieces of it. And for some of these people, this was their very first mission trip, was to go on a virtual trip. Uh, and like I said, like, there was life change that happened out of it. How can I be more intentional about how I'm living my life today? And we realize there are people who are sick who will never be able to physically be able to go on a trip. And it included them. Kids were able to learn about it. I shared a little bit with it with my nieces, and they loved that. They loved to have them all the pudding um, and help bake it at home with us. So. And then it just continues to empower the local church. We found that our partners internationally felt like their voices were still heard and they could be encouraged because we were able to have those live Zoom calls. When it felt very isolated, people felt still some connection. So we continue to do that. We found that um, this was a great, and another church found that this was a great way for them to connect with a new partner, was to get people to go on a virtual trip. And the five-day experience for an individual was $100, for a family was $150, and that really just became a donation towards that organization. So it became very affordable. And then you got like this little welcome kit that was mailed to your house that had the devotional and had some other materials in it. We want to talk a little bit about building awareness, again, because a, a number of people won't be able to go internationally, so how do we bring some of that experience here? And so uh, at Cornerstone, we have two partners that we advertise twice a year, and we just want two of them to be really well known by our church uh, members. So we'll spend three weeks every year talking about each one of those partners, and then we do some fundraising for them. And we've tried to make it as hands-on and experiential as possible. And uh, so as we were internationally, we put on the mindset of, like, what pieces of this could we bring back so that our people could experience it who won't ever be able to go? So we're thinking about, like, what is some of the food, maybe some of the cultural pieces, what items could I bring home, and then what pictures? And then we also, with that, then also think about, as we have team members on the ground, empowering them, how do they tell the story? Because they're going to be the biggest voices coming back and sharing about it. And so we talk about how can you um, leverage the platforms and leverage your influence to share what God is doing. And through that, um, teaching them how to come back and give like a one-line statement, like at our debrief time, we said, okay, just make a list of all the words or pictures or images that stand out in your mind about what this experience was like. And so they just spend some couple minutes just making a list. And we said, okay, just circle a couple of those favorite ones. And that gave them some of those tools to be able to come home and share that experience. And so you can see uh, Eric had said he just went on a weekend mission trip. And it was one of, it's what he loved doing. And he's looking forward to the next one. Uh, we had Jill go on one, and she shared that this was her first trip. And she was able to, she's a teacher here. She's able to pour into the lives internationally. And one of my favorite stories, I was in Kenya this year, and I had never heard about a proclaimer. A proclaimer is a little box, and it's run on solar power. There's a little battery in it. They cost $80, and they come in multiple different languages. And we were working with the Maasai tribe. And uh, this pastor, uh, I call him Pastor Daniel, he didn't know how to read. But he got a proclaimer, and so he had been listening to the, the Bible in his local language. And they, we came back, and this year, he was reading. The proclaimer taught him how to read, and then he got eyeglasses through a medical clinic. And it was super impactful like for him to be able to see that. And you think just from an $80 proclaimer, a whole village is now getting to hear the gospel. Uh, and so we came back and shared that story. I had posted about it on social media and sent a few text messages home. And they, I had a friend, uh, Wes, he comes to church here, and he was sharing how 
a man, he took that post and he shared it with so many family members because this is just super impactful. And so it's like, it's, it's how do we come back and share those stories? Okay, so when we talk about building awareness and how do we bring things back, one of the things that we uh, did this year is we are partnering with a church in Zambia, and they work in an area with vulnerable people. We would call it a slum area of about 40,000. And we said, man, it's so hard to contextualize that sometimes for people living uh, in the Chandler area. So we said, what would it look like if we built a model of a home on our patio so people could experience it? So we had taken pictures while we were in Zambia of the community of Chayenda. These were some of the houses that they do, these kids go to their ministry program. And we built a model, and it's a one-room house. We put a bed in it, and there really wasn't anything more than just a few pieces of clothing. And then we put outside just some of the the ways that they cook, because they don't cook in their homes, they cook outdoors. And the number of families that got to come and talk about what this looked like, I wish you could have heard the conversations. Uh, The children were saying, "I'm, I'm noticing there's no bathroom. Or where is their kitchen? Like, and what are they, they going to eat? Like, there isn't food stocked up in the house, in the kitchen. And so the conversations we were able to have and say, like, this is a family of six that lives here. And just think they compared it with their own home. And so those stories that kids got to hear were impactful. And then we invited people from who had been to that country and been in the community of Chayenda. Would you come? Would you wear a shirt that says Serve Zambia that we gave them? And just said, would you be a part to just tell stories of the impact that you had, you heard while you're on the trip? Because firsthand stories are really impactful. Um, We had some of the food also served. Another time we put together a a model of a classroom in India. They're outdoor classrooms, and so it was hot and humid. It's hot just like it is here in Phoenix. Just add like 80% humidity, and that's what a classroom looks like. And so when we were in India, we were like, okay, can you send us some of your textbooks? So we had textbooks in Telugu, and we had textbooks in English, different age levels. And again, the kids got to flip through the pages to see what those textbooks look like and be able to compare, to sit in a classroom and realize there's no electricity, Um, just the type of like very limited school supplies in the room and just the context of that. And then we took some of the material, the sari material, and tied it on the end of a pencil and said, will you take this pencil home and remember to pray for the kids who are going to school um, and getting the gospel message in India. So just another time we were working in Kenya and we said, okay, what would it look like to build a classroom or build a dorm? There's a small dorm that slept with three beds high and on the bottom bed, three kids would sleep in that space. And so families got to again walk through it and tell the story. And again, so we just kind of put that lens on what would it look like to do something experiential? We've also tried to put together videos that help tell the story, as well as pictures to take teams through. Okay, and the other area we said we talk about is just what does it look like for supporting global workers? Um, This would be missionaries. What can the church do? And I would say this is an area we still have some room for improvement and growth, but we found that our global workers really just want to be known. How do we see them and feel like they're known? Like what, and some things that we've done is like, how do we celebrate birthdays? How do we talk about anniversaries? How do we um, celebrate moment, milestones and moments in their lives? Because that matters. Like sometimes when you're living on the other side of the world, do people back home remember that I still am here and just and that exists? I think in the midst of the pandemic, we got a lot better at using technology. Everyone did, whether that's WhatsApp groups, Zoom calls, FaceTime, um, Messenger. That provided us ways to check in with people, and there's something we could all relate to. And so we actually found we got to know our global workers better in the midst of the pandemic because we worked to get get in context with them and hear what was going on. We then wanted to be able to share that with our church. So we asked, hey, would each of our global workers, would you guys send in a one minute video about what is going on in your context so we can share it? And then we called it a global worker check-in. And so that was the way we were able to share on social media what was going on. Uh, We put together prayer calls. We had someone recently who was working uh, to get their visa 
their visa was being questioned and whether they were going to be able to stay in that country. And so I said, Let, someone quickly organized a Zoom call and said, would you all just jump on and let's start praying? And so we did that for a while as they were going through interrogation and, and looking at that. And at the end, when she was granted permission to stay, it wasn't going to end. Like, let's get on and do a celebration of where we saw God work because everything, all odds were stacked against her. And so how do we celebrate those moments? So uh, those are some things. And then also, like, how do we go and visit in person? Because nothing replaces that in-person visit. So somebody from the church or who could go and spend some time. Or when they're home, how do we wrap them back into the community? Because it can be hard. How do we invite them? Come serve at this Christmas party with us. Or let's go do some fun activities together and be intentional about wrapping them in. Giving them opportunities to share in small group contexts about what God's um, been doing in their lives, and we found that's been super helpful for our global workers. And now, I'd love to be able to get just ideas of what you guys have seen work. Um, Maybe it's through global workers, or building awareness for partnerships, or international trips. Just share some ideas, or things that you're trying to figure out. Nancy, I know you said you were a global worker, missionary internationally. What did you find helpful living on the field that people did for you? Uh, One one way people came to serve was sending child care teams to Mm -hmm. care for, you know, that's like member care. Yeah. It's not necessarily working with nationals, but they they would send a group to put on a BBS for our kids that would be on a conference. Mm -hmm. pieces of them, like with in person and well, sort of. Yeah, we have to find that to, to the actual world trip. Yeah. Really put emotions and stuff in the conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have a lot of spin off of it. I don't know if I'm just challenged about it. I only have a role to do for us. So we pray for our missionaries once a month. We're very aware of individual needs. And then, you know, having resources. Right, absolutely. And I think about that with global workers and also with partners. I think that sometimes I find myself, as I get to know a country and a partner better, it's like, oh, I think I can make the decision. But I'm like, no, I'm, even though I probably know the answer, I need to make sure we stop and listen and not make a choice for someone else because that just takes away their power. But I think the more familiar you become, the easier it is to almost try and fill in answers. And so it's something you got to watch. What do you mean by global worker? Yeah, so we have stopped using the word missionary because there's a number of organizations and countries that don't allow missionaries in. So global worker is more of an easier term to use internationally. So it's just basically, it's another word for missionary. So for, for us, the global means outside of our ability to connect with them within a reasonable distance. So it's basically Mm-hmm. It's still missionary. missionary. Yeah. Yep. Have you heard of, of CHE? Yes. Community Health Evangelism. They they have that same concept of going into a community and finding out, walking alongside the community and allowing them to be in control of mm-hmm. what happens and what projects that they do, even if. Even if the group coming in feels like there's one thing more important than what they choose. Um, I went to a, it was like a week-long conference um, telling all about 
community health evangelism. I just thought it was really amazing. It was a really cool concept. Yeah. So that's pretty much what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that's such an essential piece for those people who are in the room that lead teams out of the country. And even as a team member, you need those people on the team who can really say, like, hey, how do we listen to the actual need? Because you can see things and you be like, oh, this could be done or that could be done or that could be done. And we're like, you're going to see things internationally, but stop and we need to listen to what is the local leader saying? What are their needs? And put our own needs aside. Like we were in India and someone's like, there's a businessman who's on our team and he's like, there is a much faster way to move the bricks up to the third level of the building because this man was carrying them all on his head. He's like, well, I'd like to just go and get him a wheelbarrow. <laughs> like the difference that would make, but we're like, but then it would take away that job that he has. And so it was like, it's so hard to take away our efficiency model and take that away and think about it in different contexts. And so we found, how do we prepare our teams to make sure we're listening for the voice and then we talk about that. Like, we're going to see things, but let's put that on the back burner. And so we come in with a different mindset of like, how do we encourage, hear their stories, not tell them how to do things, but learn, learn and ask questions. That curiosity piece is huge. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, and often better, or, or or a different model, and it's not a right or wrong. And so, even though you see some of it, it's like, how do we? And I think in today's context, uh, a lot of times we can get into being careful about doing really great humanitarian work, but what changes everything is Jesus and the hope. And so we can't just go internationally and just do great work without the gospel. And so that's been a big piece. Like, how do we prepare our teams to share that hope? Um, and we can't let that take a second seat. It has to be the lens that we, we come with our actions that reflect Christ. Our words need to reflect Christ. And then we need to be prepared to give an answer. And there's a number of people, as I read applications of people applying to go on trips, that can't clearly communicate what it means to be a Christian. And actually, I recently went through, uh, to help do some assessing for people who wanted to go out on the field. And it was extremely eye-opening as we had 12 households <laughs> go through it. There were some people, they were applying to be a global worker, a missionary. And we asked them, okay, well, let's just role play, like, try and share, share the gospel with me. And there were some of them who, who couldn't do it. Like, are they? We had a couple people going through, like, I don't even know if they're a Christian. And we need to stop and think about that. As, as I came back as in the role that I'm in, I'm like, I want to be intentional about every trip we go on. I'm going to teach people what does it mean to communicate the gospel message really clearly. And while that's really intimidating to people, I'm like, but we have the greatest message to share. We need to be prepared to give an answer, whether it's here in our community and internationally. And sometimes it's easier to try that uh, internationally, but then how do we bring that back? And so we've just now been really intentional with that. And then actually on our last trip, it was interesting to me. Uh, I grew up in a family where we talked a lot about prayer, and prayer was just a part of everyday life. Uh, but for a number of people, that's not the case. It's very intimidating. And then you ask people to pray in public. Well, they just shut down. So we said, okay, how do we now start equipping? But this is where we have to listen. How do we equip our team to pray? Pray for people that you may not know very well. How do we do that? And so that needs to be added into the manual. So as we learn things, we add it into the training. Because these are great spiritual disciplines that need to be added. And when you take people out of the country, this is the perfect time to pray for it. It is hard. You 
they call it, I don't think what their name is, but basically it's like a mission trip right here in our own community. And we talked about doing that course. What would it be like to do a, go on a trip called Destination Unknown? And we're going to just take them to different things. So I know the, the local church here at Central has taken um, them down to the Herd Museum, so the Native American Museum, to walk through that experience. And they bring one of their partners in to take them on that experience. And then go to a restaurant, experience it. And it's a three-day experience, and they learn different pieces and di- interact with different people in our own community. So just like absolutely what you're talking about. Kind of going off what you said, um, in our in our adult Sunday school class, they, they offered the opportunity to help in Afghanistan, kind of. Mm. So I raised my hand. And, my name and so <clears throat> these two guys, one was a pilot who flew up the Black Hawk helicopter. Mm. Jack McCain trained him, John McCain's son mm. trained him, and his brother um, both fought for the with the Afghan army against the Taliban. Mm. Their father was killed by the Taliban. Mm. And um, their family was kind of broken up when a bomb went off and they went down to the Kabul airport to get out of it. And they showed me the pictures of inside the plane. It was like a madhouse. Mm-hmm. Just people just like, like Sitting that. on the floor. There two, were no women gave birth. two women gave birth on the plane. But um, they're, they're very strict Sunni Muslims. And, um, but they did come to our church. That was huge. They came to church. I said, come to the church, tell your story. We'll get you a, a car out of it or something. So they came to our class and told their class. They said, don't tell any of our friends, because I knew some of the friends. Because if you did, we would be like Jews to them. So, but they have four kids, and one was married, and his wife's here. And, but I don't know if they did. My end game is that they become Christians, of course. But if they don't, that's OK. I got one of them a job, one of them a job working with me. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I see these four kids, and I would bet money that one, two, or three, or four of them would become Christians mm-hmm. just because our church has, has really outreach to them. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and I think even if they did, their parents would accept it mm-hmm. simply because they've come to love us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, they're there. They're there. It's just the reminder of how relationships change everything. Like, there's a lot of people who have perceptions about things, but until you know somebody and you get to know their story, that changes everything. And sometimes it takes people like us in the room who have to help champion that story and how to share it or how to interact. Because some people just, I was a part of a small group, they're like, we don't even know how to bring this up. It's awkward. So it's like, okay, who is someone who can help lead through a moment like that? So. Oh, yeah. being here at South, the Southwest. Yeah. The Commission Connection is there's lots of resources available. So Jeannie's on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Across the street and around the world. Across the street, right? Across the street, around the world. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
MC. are so powerful. How we encounter Jesus yeah. every day, how we came to know him, those are the stories that have the most impact, and that is the gospel when we share the hope. And that's what I think sometimes we use this word gospel, and people are like, oh, I'm intimidated by that. But no, so what, what has Jesus done in your life that's changed it? Share those stories. And we think about it, that's the greatest message. We should be sharing that with everybody. Um, one way in the back. No, we just have a couple minutes. <laughs> I've prayed with over a thousand people that way. I'm sure over a thousand people that way. 
went to a school that made you witness every week. I was there for 10 years. Mm. Wow. So I witnessed every week with the track and all that. But I could probably count on one hand the people that felt like ever. Mm. Mm. And I think that's why I believe in friendship. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, because people will trust you. Yeah. You know, you're a friend, so they're going to listen to you. Yeah, that's good. And it, and it sounds like there's a lot of people in the room who have... You've got the skill set. You've become more f- familiar. I'd encourage you, who can you invite to do it who doesn't know how? Because if you do it, come do it with me. That's like when we're going to Mexico I'm like, or on these trips. I'm like, guys, we're on an adventure together. And we're going to, it's not going to go as we have planned. Never, every trip never goes that way. But together, we're going to do this together. We're going to make a lot of memories. And God is always with us. And let's just re- be reminded of that and put that joy in that. It it's, can be intimidating doing it alone, but when you bring someone along to do it with you, that makes an impact. And, and just showing them, let me sh- model for you what it looks like to share my story and how God's encountered. And then afterwards, how do you intentionally have those conversations? Here's why I did that. When they said this, I knew that was my window, window in to sharing because they were looking for something. And I didn't give an answer just because I care about you. I care about you because Jesus cares about you. Or, you know, you, you make that intentional moment. So I know we're running out of time, but it is great to be able just to learn from one another, hear those ideas, and I just encourage you, keep keep doing the work. Keep sharing that hope and building relationships with people, and who can you invite in to doing that? So, uh, thanks, for sharing. thanks so much for being here. So, on your, on your virtual trips, yeah. um, I'll be honest, when I first heard about it, I was like, that's pretty cheesy, but, mm-hmm. um, but you, what you shared tonight, I was like, yeah, that actually does make sense. Like, did you have a team of people working on that, or... Was there a lot of heavy lifting on your side, or was that more? So we've had, uh, the organizations did most of the lifting. Okay. Mm-hmm. We started to work on pieces of it, and then they started pulling it together. And so they, they did the, the heavy lifting on it. But there is definitely some work that went into building the web pages to be able to do it. But I think you can leverage that on lots of, whether that's work happening here in our own cities. Like, how do we how do we leverage some of opportunities? And even, like, now I'm like, okay, how do you bring people into a room? Like, we're not going to go together, but even to sit here, we could gather for an hour. We were talking about doing some of it in person together, so you have that, but then also do it, but, you know, at home, too, so it's a little bit of both and, but sharing those cultural experiences together. Yeah, it's it's I, bonding. I know we're done, but... Yeah. So, you guys, if you need to head out, feel like you have giving, giving your workers a place to share what they're learning is... Because you're, I don't know about you, but I was like learning new stuff every day. And like, like I want to share this somewhere, and other than my newsletter, like where do I, where do I have to share it? Because everybody else around me already knows this or is learning it too, and so. And I just think that there's the, the two-way, we found the two-way intera- interactions what make it. Like while you can send a video and you can write a newsletter, yeah. how, how do it? Do people actually open it? Do they watch it? But when you could watch the responses, that was that was impactful. Do you, do you like assign a certain person in the church to a global worker? I mean, how do you? We ha- we have done that in the past, and then there's but like they're they're the key to to yeah. like getting others involved. I, I don't know. Just there's there's that is a model for some churches yeah, that they would use it. Yeah, small groups adopt them. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I know it also makes a difference when people from the the local church make it, you know, like, it needs lay leaders, it needs community members, but it also needs church staff people to pour into.